Members of the class of 2022, family, friends, welcome to the 24th annual hooding ceremony of the University of Chicago Law School. And I emphasize that word welcome. It is very good to greet all of you and to celebrate this milestone with you in person. When members of the JD class arrived at the law school in autumn of 2019, we applauded you as you entered the auditorium. And at that time, none of us could have imagined the events and challenges that would soon come and shape your time in law school. When you leave the chapel today, and you, at the end of this ceremony, we will applaud you again, and you will have earned that applause unlike any other graduating class. Members of the LLM class of 2022, you also had your experience shaped and complicated by unexpected events. Many of you were to have been members of the LLM class of 2021, but you deferred until you could join us in person. We are grateful for that. A bit later than expected that you joined us and we celebrate with you today too. All of us gather today, the events of recent times leave us with a mix of emotions and feelings, a sense of loss, a sense of accomplishment and gratitude, and a sense of hopefulness, even excitement for the future. The losses and challenges you faced were unexpected and multiple. Just as the JDs reached the halfway point of their first year, this crisis emerged, a crisis in public health, and then the economy that rippled across the country and across the globe that tested our institutions. The pandemic and the economic convulsions that accompanied it were followed by a sequence of other crises. Disputes over the proper response to the public health crisis and the economy, rancorous political divisions, mass protests over policing and racial inequities, a tense and contested election, the, the events of January 6th, and the emergence of new COVID variants. For some of us, these events in the world affected us relatively modestly. For others of us, the impacts have been deeply personal and severe, from financial turmoil to personal tragedy. For all of us, our ways of living and working changed significantly. Members of the JD class of 2022, we share another sense of loss, wholly apart from the world's events, because one of your classmates is not here today and was taken from us too soon, Elle Damore. Elle's time at the law school was short, too short, but Elle had a lasting impact on this class and on the many friends she had here and on the community that she helped build. Indeed, her many contributions to our community made her such an appropriate choice for an Ann Watson Barber Award, and I am honored that her parents are here today. It is appropriate for us to remember Elle and the enthusiasm and the energy that she brought to our community. Please pause with me for a moment to remember her. Thank you. While these losses have not faded, you, the class of 2022, inspired us and each other with your resilience and your optimism. It's an optimistic act to learn. Knowledge acquired today can be used tomorrow. It is a forward-looking act to learn. Learning shows confidence in the future and the ability of knowledge to make the world and the future better. And my, did you learn? You learned about a medical patient who endured a weirdly hairy skin graft, a reservoir that flooded a neighboring mine, a group of shipwrecked voyagers that resorted to cannibalism, and an automobile distributor that sought to avoid litigation in Oklahoma. You learned a good deal of the law itself. You learned a lot of legal doctrine. And now, and between January 27th and 28th in most states, the bar exam, you will learn a lot more law. But you at the law school have learned so much more than specific doctrines. You learned how to think about legal problems, how to interpret legal texts, how to engage in common law reasoning, how to disentangle thorny legal problems, how to find solutions that have benefits for everyone involved. You learned to approach legal questions with rigorous thought, careful reasoning, and to examine questions from multiple perspectives. An analytical approach requires an openness to ideas and a commitment to subject those ideas to careful scrutiny. 
So more than legal doctrines and even more than a way of thinking, you learned a set of values, values that I believe are distinctly associated with the University of Chicago. You learned a joy in ideas and that ideas are made better by conversation and questioning. You saw that serious analytical inquiry at the University of Chicago is usually not a solo enterprise. It's a collective endeavor, a form of joint production. And that's why our law school relies on the Socratic method. You may have been slightly anxious about those first cold calls, but you learned to speak up in class, to contribute your thoughts, and to be excited about it. At times, your classmates gave such great answers that you took notes on it, or you asked a question that was so insightful you wished you'd thought of it. And at other times, your joint intellectual inquiry was in writing. Your classmates worked side by side with you, drafting a motion in the clinic. They agreed to give you feedback on a draft comment for the journal. Questioning and discussing ideas makes them better. Often questions from and discussion with someone who thinks differently and disagrees makes for the most progress. It is how knowledge grows. This commitment to ideas, to inquiry, and to collective discussion is, I believe, distinctively University of Chicago. This dedication to enjoy in serious analytical inquiry is a hallmark of our graduates. Wherever you go in your career, this value will serve you well. So you learned some legal doctrine, you learned a way of thinking, you learned to value ideas and inquiry, you learn this over many days and many nights of study and discussion with your classmates, all of the hours you spent in our classrooms and clinics, and yes, on Zoom, in dialogue with our faculty, as well as the hours you spent in the building, in the green lounge, the carols, the journal offices, studying, outlining, writing, rewriting, rewriting again, arguing, discussing, and ultimately thinking. It was hard work, and you did it. Congratulations. For this, you should feel a deep sense of accomplishment and a sense of gratitude. Your family and friends who supported you with encouragement and perhaps in more tangible ways helped you achieve this. When they congratulate you today, don't forget to thank them. Also, in the ways I've just described, your classmates have helped you get here, and so you too have helped them. Be sure to thank them by making the bonds and the friendships that you have formed here the lasting ones. Today, you should also feel a sense of optimism and excitement for the future. Now, it's unlikely that your professional work is ever going to involve hairy skin grafts, or shipwrecks, or flooding reservoirs, or maybe not automobile distributors. But instead, your careers may take many paths. Clerkships, government service, big law, small law, public interest, leaving the practice of law and entering the business world, management, entrepreneurship, or perhaps some other great adventure. All of these paths are worthwhile. And in your career, you may have the opportunity to pursue more than one of them. Perhaps at different points in time, you'll pursue all of them. All of them need your rigorous analytical minds, your sound judgment. Whatever your professional work is, it is certain to involve large and thorny problems. And as you progress in your career, as a University of Chicago Law School graduate, you may begin to acquire important responsibility for, var for various institutions. Your work will help determine whether our institutions meet our expectations of them whether they help protect rights, advance justice, or improve the quality of life. The skills and knowledge you acquired here will help you tackle those large and thorny problems and help improve our legal system. Your future clients and your constituents will need you to continue to learn and refine your thinking. Your education does not end when you walk out of this chapel or when you walk out of the bar exam, again, July 27th, 28th. Whatever you do, continue to love ideas and inquiry in that distinctive Chicago way. The class of 2022 will be known as the class that attended the law school during an extraordinary time. You met difficult challenges. You responded with an unmatched dedication to learning 
and to each other and to our community. This should be a source of pride for you as it is for us. An inspiration that whatever challenges lie ahead and whatever opportunities lie ahead, you will meet them, seize them, and thrive. On this day, as you graduate from our law school, you should feel that sense of accomplishment, have a reason to celebrate, and most of all, have confidence in your future, both our own future and the future of the law. We celebrate your accomplishment. We look with confidence to the future. We are proud of you. Now go out there and make us proud again. Congratulations. It is now my honor to introduce our distinguished alumna of the year, Emily Nicklin, member of the class of 1977. Emily Nicklin is a senior litigation partner at the firm of Kirkland and Ellis. Her biography on her firm's website will tell you that her practice spans a wide range of areas, from constitutional and municipal law to security and securities and common law fraud, torts, contracts, and especially the professional liability of accountants and consultants. What this official biography does not tell you is that Emily Nicklin is a legendary trial lawyer. She is well known for her laser-like intelligence, her indefatigable work ethic, her clear-eyed practicality, and her unerring sense of humor. Opposing counsel fear her cross-examinations, and rightly so. In every case, she has a complete mastery of the facts and the law, an attentive ear for testimony, and can seize on witnesses' statements, especially their missteps, in a way that swings the outcome of cases. Her rapport with the jury has been said to be simultaneously folksy and fierce. She's known as the lawyer that the jurors most wish to have a beer with. Emily Nicklin received her undergraduate degree here at the University of Chicago and then attended the law school. After graduating, she clerked for federal judge George Layton in the Northern District of Illinois and then joined Kirkland and Ellis. She became a partner a mere four years after joining the firm, and except for two years during which she served as deputy corporation counsel in the city of Chicago, she has spent her entire career at Kirkland. For an astonishing 15 years, she served on the firm's management committee. She has received numerous accolades. For example, she's been included every year since 1995 on the list of super lawyers. In addition to her incredible success as a litigator, Emily Nicklin has been a generous leader and servant in numerous civic and not-for-profit organizations. She has held leadership roles at the Chicago Bar Foundation, the Legal Assistance Foundation of Metropolitan Chicago, and the American Constitution Society, She's currently board chair of Planned Parenthood of Illinois. But more than any other organization, the University of Chicago has been the beneficiary of Emily Nicklin's selfless service. She has performed just about every conceivable volunteer role on campus. She served on the laboratory schools board. She's a life member of the College Advisory Council. She served as co-chair for her law school reunion committee for every cycle in recent memory, including her recent 45th reunion. Congratulations again, Emily. She has been a member of the university's board of trustees since 2004, as well as the medical center's board since 2007. And she served, and for five years, she was chair of the medical center board. And she served as co-chair of the university's most recent capital campaign called Inquiry and Impact. And her leadership resulted in record resources being raised for the mission of the university and the law school. Emily Nicklin has joked that despite her success in representing accounting, accountants and her ability to raise record amounts of philanthropic funds, that when she was a student, she dropped out of accounting for lawyers. She says she can't balance her checkbook. But she does say that she learned at the University of Chicago that it is good to seek out what you do not know. In fact, Emily Nicklin knows a lot, a whole lot. And as dean, I have regularly sought her advice and wisdom for which I am very grateful. I am delighted that she will share today with you some of her knowledge. It's an honor to introduce our distinguished alumna of 2022. Please join me in welcoming Emily Nicklin.
I told Tom walking over here that I had been, I knew I'd been asked to speak to you all, but I was unaware that there was going to be an award of all involved. And um, I kind of had the same reaction to that that have, you've seen in the Three Stooges, where they come into a room, it's usually a lawyer's room, they come into a, a conference room, and the lawyer stands up and says, gentlemen, gentlemen, and they turn around to see who's come in. That's how I feel about this. Because let me tell you something, I have sat in this chapel, I have sat in this chapel as a graduate of the law school. I have sat in this chapel as a family member, a mom, and also as, as an aunt. And I have sat in this chapel now as a speaker, which I really regard as sort of revenge. But the best role was actually being the family, being the mom. So really, before I start digging into these graduates, congratulations to you family members out there. You really did the work. Nice job. And now I will tell you that when Tom Miles asked me to speak, I said yes, without reflecting at all on what I might say. As a trial lawyer and as a mom, I seize the mic whenever possible. In my view, he who pauses is the listener. But having accepted, I developed anxiety for two reasons. First, it came to my attention that here at the university, I will be followed by a faculty speaker who this year, really, someone save me, is Frank Easterbrook. <laughs> who has the advantage, so many advantages, but the one that I focused on was the advantage of knowing this audience of students who have been in the years long habit of paying to listen to him. Whereas in my practice, judges and jurors listen to me only because they're paid to do so by taxpayers and witnesses only because they're under subpoena. Second, I remembered that most, gra most graduation speeches combine the qualities, they give advice, right? Um, so they thus combine the qualities of being platitudinous with being unmemorable. Think of Shakespeare's Hamlet when La Polonius gives advice to Laertes who is about to embark, who's leaving, uh, imminent departure for foreign lands and studies, to which we owe such memorable observations as neither a borrower nor a lender be and give every man thine ear, but few thy voice, and to thine own self be true. But I got over these concerns, and I'm here to give you advice, which I learned to do best as a mom, actually. You might find, like my kids, you might find some of it mildly interesting. You will definitely find some of it boring. And you will certainly forget it within a week. Why should you be different from the children? Nonetheless, I am invested in you, because you now graduate from the same remarkable law school that I did, and that enabled me, as you have now been enabled. And you look like a fairly promising bunch to me. I think you're gonna grow up to be quite influential. Movers and shakers, as they say, so I have decided to tell you what I think. And it will not surprise you that my children could never stop me either. So, I am going to talk first about the beginnings of your soon-to-be-remarkable careers, where you will have a chance to do things in the external world that will allow you to become a legend in more than your own mind. Second, I am going to talk about the long view for you and the world. This won't take too long. Now, the first few years, the beginning of your careers. <clears throat> you will struggle to appear to know what you are doing. <laughs> to hide your fear that you are about to irretrievably screw it up. You will reverberate like a pneumatic drill, at least inwardly, hopefully not outwardly and visibly. And you will learn to appreciate the perspicacity of the observation, I think by Yogi Berra, that in theory there is no difference between theory and practice. But in practice there is. In short, What's about to happen to you will be nothing like law school. Now, during this time, a small voice, mostly small, ins inside you will insistently say, stop it, 
stop it now. Don't volunteer for fill in the blank, this or that assignment. You've never done that before. You don't know how to do it, and you don't know what you're doing. And my advice to you is turn down your hearing aid. Do the stuff that you have never done. If you're going to be a trial lawyer, sign up to dig up the facts. Find the witnesses, read the documents, get the evidence, cross-examine whomever you must. If you're going to be a deal lawyer, get into negotiations. Walk the client through the deal decision points that have been worked out so far. This is a people profession. It's even supposed to be a helping profession. So get to where the people are, the clients, the courtrooms, with the judges and the jurors and the bailiffs and the, and the uh, court reporters. Make friends with the two of them. They, will do, they really are the most important people. Go where the facts are whether at companies or in government. Like they say in Hamilton, get into the room where it happens. Do not, do not hide out in your office writing nasty legalistic letters or swapping endless drafts of briefs or deal documents with your erstwhile classmates who are soon to be your adversaries or your co-counsels. Do not write endless legal research memos that are like nautilus shells with a whirl in the center that is symmetrical and that make me think of the sea and lead to nowhere in particular. Do not make endless work stream lists for projects or deals that you hope that no one will actually ask you to do. Do not become the go-to person for the cut and paste of prior due diligence or ancillary deal documents. Do not form the view that staying in your office is the best or only path to becoming a judge, if you can work in a little politics. Too many judges today first saw the inside of a courtroom when they were being measured for their robes, and in my view, it's buggering up a lot of things. This is a people business. Get out to the people. You get the idea? Now, as I said, this will make you anxious. And this just in, that anxiety will never go away. Because if you are doing the work right, what you're doing is important to the people with whom you are interacting. To your clients, it will be unbelievably important. You will be all that stands between them and dishonor, or loss of funds, or loss of liberty. They will arrive to see you, plaintiffs, defendants, whomever, at best, they're misunderstood, and at worst, they are in so much trouble, it's not clear you're going to be able to dig them out of that hole. But what you're doing is important, and so you will always be somewhat anxious about it, even after you're experienced. But here's the good news. You will still get butterflies in your stomach when you go into the courtroom, when you pick the jury, when you go to, to negotiate the deal, when you stand up in the Supreme Court. But the butterflies will fly in formation. For those of you brimming with confidence, and I know you're out there, <laughs> because my son graduated from the law school and he was one of them, um, I have different advice. And for that, I have only an illustration. The great French actress Sarah Bernhardt, look her up if you haven't, if you don't know who she is, but Sarah Bernhardt was a martyr, a martyr to stage fright. Um, she used to stand in the wings before every performance, throwing up in a bucket. Uh, one day, she was, or evening, she was doing this before going on this phage or whatever, and uh, she was standing next to two supernumeraries. You know what supernumeraries are? They're those people in the play or the opera who, who march in carrying spears and wearing helmets with fringes and deal with those things on the top. And then, they, and then they hold the spears and they stand in the back and they say nothing. Those are supernumeraries. Um, she was standing next to two supernumeraries, one of whom said to the other, I never get stage fright. And Bernhardt turned around and said, don't worry, when you're good, you will. <laughs> Remember that. You get the idea. So, now I do not say that taking these risks and pushing yourself means that you will always succeed. It will be messy. You won't always succeed. But it's good for you. 
It will teach you to fail. It will teach you to lose. It won't kill you. You will get up one more time than you are knocked down. And that actually is the essence of being a champion. And it certainly is the essence of repeat performances in courtrooms. You can't climb into the ring without getting punched in the face, at least occasionally. You just hope that when you finish, all the blood on the floor isn't yours. But doing this, among other things, will teach you, if you haven't already learned from the many experiences you've had, to be resilient. And it will teach you to be hard on your opinions, because you're going to find out how often you're wrong. It is not a straight line from God's lips to your ears. <clears throat> so questioning your conclusions, your biases, your privilege, your arguments, this will save you in a lot of ways, make it more likely you will win over time. Try to remember what Mark Twain said. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. But take the risks, go out there, fight, win, lose, survive. Now, switching to the longer view, whose relevance is immediate, so don't fall asleep, but more enduring, because some things have not changed, although some things have, although not nearly enough, so listen up. Here are the things that have changed, at least in this microcosm of this law school. I graduated almost half a century ago. I came direct from sixth grade. Um, <laughs> Jimmy Carter was president. No lie. Uh, the first Star Wars movie was released the, uh, the, my final week of third year. I went to see it after my creditor's rights exam. Uh, and when I graduated, the faculty here was 100% white, 100% male, and I am quite sure they had all completed their orthodonture. The student body was mostly a mirror of that law school faculty. Almost all of them were white, almost all of them were male, and they all had bright, shiny smiles. In my class, less than 10% of us were women, less than 1% identified as persons of color. I mean, there was one person. I guess we were admitted because we had that orthodontia thing down, so we met two of the three requirements for getting in. But today, things have changed. The faculty is 60% male and 40% female, 12% identify as persons of color. And today, the student body is only half male, the remainder being women and other. And 37% of you students identify as persons of color. I would call this a good start. But there's still a long way to go. And I hope you will all continue to press for and to lead change. Because in your roles, even in this advanced, changing, progressing world, you should each bear in mind one thing you know. You got here in part by being very intentional. You are very intelligent. You're very hardworking. That's why we're congratulating you, and that's why we celebrate your achievements today. You've been very intentional about your life so far. It hasn't all been beers at Jimmy's, or Ida Noyes, or Thursday nights at Bar Review. Nor have you been hiding out during the pandemic. You were back in your rooms in front of your, your computers working. But recognize. You should be very intentional now about what you set as your lifelong goals. And that's because more than almost anyone on this planet, you're likely to reach those goals. This is true for a whole bunch of fortuitous reasons, which is the fancy way of saying you are all incredibly lucky. You are lucky to live in a mature, if challenged, worldwide empire, one of only two on the planet. You are lucky that this empire is one that is a democracy governed by the rule of law, at least currently. You're all going to have to work on that. Don't laugh. You are lucky to have abundant social capital. The human network of your classmates and your teachers and professional mentors who have accompanied you thus far and who will remain in your life if you treat them well. You are incredibly lucky to have been born into a nice family who encouraged you to go to succeed in all you did or who helped you to get educated and go to law school and college and all. Or if you were born into a not so nice family, you're still lucky. 
that you happen to be made of the sort of DNA that brought you to this place where you eventually got educated, went to college, and graduated from law school. So you pulled yourself up by your bootlaces, as they say, but you're still lucky because you didn't make your DNA, and those weren't even your bootlaces. So you're now capping this uh, long string of incredible luck with finishing your professional education and getting this prestigious and enabling law degree. And you're likely to accumulate a lot of power and authority as a result of all that luck. Try to remember this as you all move forward because it should spur you to some particular conduct in the world, which brings me to really the last part of my advice, which is given all this good fortune, this luck, you will not be surprised that I profoundly wish for you that you remember and bear in mind in the heights of your astonishing success, that you are like a turtle in a tree. You didn't get there by yourself. And so this means in turn, you must lift while you climb. You must, as they say, give back. You could give back to those who are on the same path. I understand that about 80% of you got some scholarship help here. You could start with that, for example. But you should also give back to the world that has made you so fortuitously privileged, especially as you are lawyers. You're going to have lots of opportunities to do this. Why? Because law is often used by the powerful to oppress. This may have come to your attention. You can change that. You can spend some or all of your time, your brains, and your energy to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. What do I mean when I say comfort the afflicted? Back to the people business. Go to the border crossing and the immigrant detention center. Go to the prison. Go to the homeless shelter. Go to the domestic violence shelter. As one lawyer who works all the time, full time, in such venues told me, prayers help, but prayers and a lawyer help more. There are a lot of folks who need lawyers to represent them. Energetic, creative, smart lawyers like you. And afflict the comfortable, because there are government agencies, legislatures, and oh, especially private actors that make mistakes and use or break the laws to wound the planet, to damage the environment, to injure public health, to keep kids out of school programs because they're different, or deny people access to pretrial release, or expose people to violence in their schools or supermarkets or hospitals, to deny people access to the ballot or access to health care. I know, whether or not you agree abortion is health care, whether a, a whenever a government makes a decision about who gets care, whether it is family planning or vaccination or hospitalization when ill, this matters. It matters to the health of society. And it should matter to you. You can do something about all these things because whatever your politics, whatever your social values, you have the skill sets, the brains, the energy, and the social clout to do something about these issues. So don't spend all your time making the world a safer place for the Fortune 500, or big tech, or Robin Baron tech disruptors, or the parasitic Lamora who hang on their shark-like sides, private equity investors and corporate raiders and big financial firms. And don't hang around too much with their kissing cousins, prosecutors, and powerful government officials, just, just to mention a few of the people who will rove the halls you will soon occupy at major law firms and companies and legislatures and state houses and city halls and government offices. These are persons you may become, especially if you don't leave in your life with some public service. Although I should say that if you came just for the money, uh, you missed the turn off at 57th Street for Booth. Um, <laughs> and you can see what my view is. Don't just be 
they are lawyers, okay? You can do more than help this nation decide which group of middle-aged guys gets to keep the money. Because it is not true, it is not true that money is life's report card. And it is not true that power is life's report card. As Einstein said, try not to become a person of success, but rather a person of value. So as the years go by, you will get two things out of taking my advice, at least two. The children haven't done it so far, but I haven't given up. You know, my mom says I haven't broken their spirits, but I haven't, I haven't stopped trying either. Um, first, <clears throat> The amount of satisfaction you will get if you lift up others while you climb is immense. Whatever the world gives you in power and treasure because of your accomplishments will be dwarfed by how good it will make you feel to be in the end of this business that involves justice and fairness and making the world a better place. Second, as your power and authority and stature grows, try to remember that what is allowed is not the same as what is wise, let alone what is good. Because as you get older and more and more experienced, you will be in a position to advise people on gray areas. The decision is the client's. But their, but their decision should be informed and the information comes from you. And the, and the question will be not what's allowed, but what is wise. You will get, you will get the ability to give, an advice on that, to, to give advice on that subject, but you're going to have to work at it by having the values I've talked about and engaging in the conduct I urge on you. So, be prepared to navigate those gray areas as you get older and to give that advice, to treat everything as though all the clients matters as though it's really important, because it is to them, to deal with the butterflies in your stomach and to enjoy this hard and good work you're about to do. I'm going to close by saying to you what I used to say to the kids when I sent them off to school every morning, which is something I actually stole from a Spartan mother when she sent her child off to battle. I've told you what I can. Now, come back with your shield or on it. Thank you very much, Emily. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our faculty speaker, our senior lecturer and judge on the US Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, Frank Easterbrook. Introducing Judge Easterbrook is a distinct honor, but it also poses distinct difficulties. Because Judge Easterbrook has simultaneously led two extraordinary careers. One as a legal practitioner and judge, and another as an academic. Each of these careers is filled with staggering accomplishments, and yet it is difficult for us to know which is the primary job and which is mere moonlighting. Judge Eastbrook graduated from Swarthmore College and then attended our law school, where he was a member of the Law Review, graduating in 1973 and as a member of Order of the Coif. After a clerkship with Judge Levin Campbell on the US Court of Appeals for the First Circuit, he joined the Justice Department as an assistant to the Solicitor General, where he was the youngest person ever to hold that role. He later became Deputy Solicitor General, and during his time in the Solicitor General's office, he argued more than 20 cases before the US Supreme Court, an astonishing figure. And he established a reputation as one of the nation's top appellate advocates. In 1985, he was confirmed to the US Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit, and he became the youngest federal appellate judge at that time, 
since 1892. He served as the circuit's chief judge from 2006 to 2013. Judge Eastbrook is one of the most influential appellate judges in the country. Commentators regularly call him a judicial superstar. His opinions are among the most cited by other courts, and he has shaped the law, not only in the Seventh Circuit, but around the country. Now, members of the class of 2022, you, like law students all over the country, have encountered Judge Eastbrook's opinions in your, in your case books, in course after course. Indeed, I think when a, when a law student encounters an Easterbrook opinion in a case book, it makes that night's reading a treat. An Easterbrook opinion leaves no one unmoved. His opinions are distinctive in the clarity and insightfulness of their legal analysis. His opinions are also famed for their writing style. His writing possesses an uncommon directness, freshness, naturalness. Dare I say, he is the Hemingway of the bench. His style cannot be imitated because he writes his own opinions and does not delegate it to his clerks. Now, I think that we can all agree that for a series of moonlighting jobs, this is pretty good. In my view, Judge Easterbrook's real career has been as an academic. He joined our faculty in 1979 and soon became the Lee and Brenda Freeman Professor of Law. Upon his confirmation to the Seventh Circuit, he became senior lecturer. Judge Easterbrook's scholarship is incredible in its volume and its astounding impact. He has made paradigm-shifting contributions in field after field. His scholarship in antitrust, especially the question of predatory pricing, has helped define what is now known as the Chicago School of Antitrust. In the area of corporate law, his collaboration with our former dean, Dan Fischel, produced a sunburst of scholarship in corporate law that culminated in the publication of their magnificent book, The Economic Structure of Corporate Law. Earlier this year, the law school celebrated the 25th anniversary of that book. Theirs is a scholarship that truly defined a field, a field that remains as deeply engaged with their ideas today as it was when those articles were first published. Judge Eastbrook is also a leading figure in legal interpretation. His articles, statutes, domains, and the ways of criticizing a court, just to pick two examples, are classic, even canonical contributions. I'm honored to welcome Judge Eastbrook to the podium as part of his real job. Our 2022 faculty speaker, our senior lecturer, Judge Frank Easterbrook. Thank you, Tom, for that unduly generous introduction. But he is right that I speak to you today as a member of the faculty, but what I have to say is informed by the time I've spent as a law clerk, an appellate advocate, an economic consultant, a teacher, a scholar, and a judge over the course of 49 years since graduating from this law school. That combination gives me some perspective on the legal process. I want to use my brief time to disparage a view that is common in the press, the halls of Congress, and even the legal academy, the attitudinal model of judicial behavior, which asserts that decisions reflect the judge's background and politics, or perhaps just the views of the presidents who appointed them, rather than any discrete legal doctrine. We have about a month to go in the Supreme Court's current term. Many five to four and six to three decisions are impending. The press will bemoan the justices inability to agree and assert that politics or the justices ideology explains the divisions. Those of you who have encountered the attitudinal model in class will nod sagely. You and the press will be wrong. Suppose the justices who are usually called conservative were to resign tomorrow and be replaced by President Biden. The reconstituted court would still find lots of cases to be hard. It would grant review in those hard cases and decide many of them five to four. Cases that the Roberts Court finds hard 
This hypothetical court would find easy and decide nine to nothing. But lawyers would then stop presenting those disputes. They would bring more and more of the disputes that divide the new court. And that's exactly what did happen on a Supreme Court dominated by justices appointed by President Franklin Roosevelt. To those who specialize in the economic analysis of law, the effect is known as selection pressure in litigation. The choices made by lawyers and the judges themselves ensure substantial disagreement even when there is no ideological difference among the judges. And this also makes it hard to blame politics for the disagreement we actually observe. The rate of disagreement among the justices has been stable for more than 80 years. The current court has the same rate of dissent as the court that sat in 1945, even though the 1945 court had eight of the nine justices appointed by a single president. Selection pressure is responsible for this stability. Turn from law to science. Is Pluto a planet? Astronomers answered no by a closely divided vote. Is Einstein's theory of general relativity right, or should it be replaced by modified Newtonian dynamics? Should string theory replace the approach known as the standard model? Scientists disagree about these and many other questions. There's no need to resort to ideology or politics to understand disagreement among specialists who tackle the dispute's hardest questions. And that's what the Supreme Court does. Given selection pressure in litigation, the puzzling feature of the judicial system is agreement. There is much more agreement than the attitudinal model, or anyone who's read Wittgenstein, can explain. Judges of my court agree in 97% of all appeals. The Supreme Court regularly decides about 40% of its cases unanimously. Last term, the figure was 43% unanimous and another 15% with only one dissent, a total of 58% lopsided. That's impossible to explain by noting that six justices were appointed by presidents of one party and three by presidents of another. And again, these are the hardest cases in the legal system, which reached the Supreme Court because judges of other courts were at odds. It isn't just technical disputes that end unanimously. I want you to think about a case that some of you may have met in class, known as Perry against Perez, a reapportionment dispute that concerned how districts in Texas would be drawn and whether they would favor Hispanic candidates. All nine justices rejected the contentions of both the Obama administration, representing the political left's perspective, and the state of Texas, representing the right's perspective. Both state and national politicians and editorial writers had strongly disagreed about what should be done in Perry, but the justices resolved that case unanimously. Here's another example. Two weeks ago, the justices considered whether a business can be said to waive a contractual right of arbitration by litigating against one of its workers before finally invoking the arbitration contract. The Court of Appeals said that arbitration is a favorite of the law, so waiver is possible only if the other side is prejudiced, and mere delay differs from prejudice. The appellate decision had substantial support elsewhere. Nine of the 11 regional courts of appeals had taken that same position. The case presented a political conflict, too. The left today decries contracts that force workers into arbitration, while the right tends to support arbitration. This is, by the way, a reverse of the historical stance in which labor unions were the ones that demanded arbitration. So we have a legal conflict and a political conflict in the same case. The result? A unanimous anti-arbitration decision written by Justice Kagan holding that arbitration is not protected by special rules, but must be resolved according to the normal law of contract. 
I'm speaking today as a member of the faculty, and it may be appropriate to contrast my jurisprudence with that of Circuit Judge Wood, another faculty member. It turns out that we agree on legal issues almost all of the time, even though she is a liberal Democrat, while I am a libertarian. Or think of Justice Kagan, the former Chicago faculty member who sits on the Supreme Court. Justice Kagan agrees with Justice Thomas 86, sorry, 46% of the time. And by agree, I mean agree on result and reasoning. While well, she agrees with Justice Sotomayor 81% of the time. To put this differently, one justice appointed by President Obama agrees with the other only 35% more often than with the justice that she disagrees with the most. The party-based differences in voting behavior that we see in Congress are much greater. There's another form of potential conflict that deserves attention. Commentators in the press and members of the legal academy routinely declare that the current Supreme Court is a captive of the business lobby and decides cases according to what serves corporate rather than individual interest. For the past few years, I've been gathering data on that topic, and the court's actual results tell a different story. Most business cases are decided without dissent, that is, nine to nothing or eight to nothing. Of the cases that in my study I classify as business decisions, fully 60% were unanimous, which is higher than the unanimity figure I've just given you for all kinds of cases. Another 5% had only one dissent. So 65% of all business cases lead to a consensus. That isn't how Congress votes on business issues. Political scientists in the press usually want to evaluate liberal versus conservative outcomes. I treat a decision as liberal if consumers, employees, investors, or the government prevail over a business, or if a small business prevails over a large one. What has happened in the most recent terms? I counted 61 liberal decisions, 65 conservative decisions, and the rest not classifiable. Are all of you still fixed to your seats? You know the Supreme Court is conservative, right? But liberal and conservative business decisions are equally likely. That's exactly what should happen if they are making apolitical decisions about which cases to accept and handling their docket based on law rather than politics. Something other than ideology produces a remarkable degree of consensus in the legal system's toughest cases. Justices reach agreement even when selection pressure says they shouldn't be able to do so. You should therefore think better of the judicial system than the editorial pages do. In the United States, the rule of law really differs from the rule of judges. Neutrality is a comfort to all who must stand before a court and to all of us who favor equal justice under law. You should keep this in mind when you encounter the legal system whether as a participant or as a spectator. Those of you graduating today can look forward to a career in a professional discipline, not just to, to a career in politics by another name. Doubtless some judges behave like politicians some of the time, but all politicians behave like politicians all of the time. The difference is considerable and provides the makings for rewarding careers. I wish you all the best in them. Thank you very much, Judge Eastbrook. We will now proceed to the hooding of the graduates and the distribution of degrees.
Dean Miles, it is my honor to present these students who have completed the program of studies prescribed by the faculty of the law school. They have been awarded the degree of Master of Laws by the Board of Trustees. I congratulate these graduates on the successful completion of a program of advanced study in the law school culminating in the degree Master of Laws. Will the graduates please come forward to receive your diploma and then your academic hood as I call your name. Abdulaziz Fahad Alaskar. <laughs> Munira Al Mulkhim. Bavni Anan. Arub Ansar. Sven Asmussen. Sarah Bakchi. Pega Bani Hashemi. Rosario Paz Becker Seco. Mark Bircher. Elizabeth Bulos. Fengfei Kai. Yui Yin Alvin Chung. Charu Chitwan. Juan Jose Crespo. Yuka Daimon. Tadeu Enrique de Almeida Buarque Bretas. Enrico Drigani. Christoph Eichinger. Joaquin Gayastegui Rodriguez. Charlotte Garcia Moreno. Eleni Amalia Giannacopolo. Nicole Gresati Fernandez. Hiroto Hayashi. Ana Maria Herrera. Yurika Inouye. Kentaro Isogai. Kwan Yuen Yu. Maria Dolores Jimenez Calderon. Min Kwan. Marcela Juncaira Cesar Pirola. Spirodon E. Calogeropoulos. Pei Lin Kang. Anna Evelina Carlson. Fabian Kretzelmeier. Franziska Lange Schleute. He Wung Lee.
José Manuel Yamazales. Enrique López Scherer. Thiago Molina Ferreira. Juliana Maria Molinelli. Pamela Midori Morales Nakandakari. Adrián Moreno. Yuki Mori. Olga María Mutis Ordóñez. Ana Paula Novoa. Rino Okawa. Bruna Pavanello. María Cristina Pezzulo. Julian Pricking. Giovanna Reno Duque. Yutaro Saito. Yared Salgado Solorzano. Francisco José Sama. Masataka Sato. Negar Shaban. Maiko Shinoto. Yi Wei Sun. Stanislav Zemplinski. Chunhapak Teja Kum Torankij. Tetsuya Tamura. Rodrigo Valencia Navarro. Justicia Ávila Veda. José Félix Viafuerte Mendoza. Andrés Bodanovich. Zhu Pao Wang. Zhen Wang. Wanawat Wichakit. Ian James Wilkinson. Rafael Weiss. Ahmed Gediz Yerlikaya. Feifei Yi. Maki Yoshino. Nicole Zenaro Buarque Bretas. Yi Yuan Zhang. Yu Xuan Zhao. Zhao. 
Ziyue Zhou. Congratulations to the LLM class of 2022. Dean Miles, it is my honor to present these students who have attained scholarly distinction in advanced studies and have prepared a dissertation which contributes to knowledge in a particular field of research. On behalf of the faculty of the law school, I have the honor to present the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Jurisprudence as conferred by the Board of Trustees. I congratulate these graduates on the successful completion of a program of advanced study in the law school culminating in a degree, Doctor of Jurisprudence. Will the graduates please come forward to receive your diploma and then your academic hood as I call your name. Yali Peng. Yali. Yali is being hooded by her thesis advisor, Professor Richard McAdams. Ziv Schwartz. Ziv is being hooded by his thesis advisor, Professor William Hubbard. Congratulations to the JSD class of 2022. Dean Miles, it is my honor to present these students who have fulfilled all of the requirements prescribed by the faculty of the law school to qualify them for the profession of law. They have been awarded the degree of Doctor of Law by the Board of Trustees. I congratulate these graduates on the successful completion of a program of study in the law school culminating in the degree Doctor of Law. Will the graduates please come forward to receive your diploma and then your academic hood as I call your name. Hannah Storm Abrams. Chaim Ariel Ayash. Anthony Cooper Alessi. Blake H. Altman. Alonzo Akihe. Marissa Josephine Ball. Catherine Elizabeth Banks. Edmund Thurston Roger Bannister. Tasbiha Batul. Biran Paul Singh Bat. Sean James Imes Beecroft. Alexander Paul Beer. Alexander is being hooded by his grandfather, Professor William Landis. Nina Victoria Benavides. Isabella Bergonzoli Jaramillo.
Jordan Allen Block. Anna Foley Boardman. Wilson Paul Boardman. Brian S. Bornhoft. Jacob Botros. William L. Boudreau. Alexandra Jane Bright. Nicole Marie Briones. Eleanor F. Brock. Eleanor is being hooded by her mother, Enid Van Hoven Brock. Liam Alexander Brown. Rachel Lee Brown. Mitchell Evan Kaminer. Gary Canapa. Ryan Matthew Cannon. Samuel R. Caparelli. Timothy James Carey, Jr. Austin Michael Clark Karsh. Jennifer Nianhua Chang. Kevin Andrew Chapman. Eugen Rosa Chong. Takir Chowdhury. Griffin A. Clark. Robert Stephen Clark. Jess Alexander Clay. Jason H. Clayton. Sarah Devora Cohen. George Riley Colligan. Jonathan David Concepcion. Kyra May Cooper. Christopher Michael Crum. Alexandra Smith Cullen. Lena Dayam. Evan M. De Casa. Tony Gandolfo De Cario. Sophie Ann Desch. Lazaro Donis Munoz. Claire Marlo Downing. Katya El Tayeb. Joshua Thomas Ellis. Ross Ewing. Yeah. 
Stephen Alexander Farrow. Jake Anthony Ferjaka. Austin Alexander Foyer. Darby Elaine Finley. Hannah Brittany Fisher. Joshua Alex Fox. Emily Caroline Snell Freeman. Julian Edward Leslie Gale. Travis Jamal Gadado. Emma K. Gilmore. Mira Gorjala. Natalie Marie Granda. Alexandra Bonner Green. Kelly Gregg. Natalie Nicole Griffin. Keon Hum. Alexandra Williams Hale. Nicholas Halleck. Rebecca J. Hansen. Jacqueline Francis Horwitz. Richard Henry Howe. Conley Karlovic Hurst. Megan Christina Ingram. Simon David Jacobs. Felix Jen. Irene Jun. Iwei Jang. Jacob Edward Johnson. Kimberly R. Johnson. James E. Jones. Mina Kandalu. Reagan Woodson Cap. Brianna C. Katinik. Rachel Alyssa Katzen. Crofton Kelly. Cicely Maleva Kiesel. Carol Jian Kim. Ludmila Kirinchenko. Jordan Julius Kleist. Reka Subashini Korlapera. Kyle Anthony Kreider. Daisha Shushian Kwok. Kelsey Lynn Lobbs. William Peter Lattice.
Daniel Alejandro Lastres. Thomas Francis Lawton. Elise Marie Lacrone. Yana Lee. Gwendolyn Hope Lemley. Andrew Philip Leonard. Jennifer Longway Lynn. Kimberly Liu. Angel Ronette Lockhart. Catherine F. Luo. Sarah E. Meyer. Connor Mallon. Benjamin Samuel Mann. Mark Robert Marziotti. Syed Mateen. Kayla Marie Mayberry. Kelly C. McGee. Christian McGuire. Alexander M. McNamara. Alexander Christian Mead. Henry Visser Melville. Hunter Andrew Michelson. Alexander Thomas Minuet Lovrine. Sophie Talon Mir Zion. Jacob Lee Mitchell. Ryan Esther Molis. Dylan Moore. Savannah Lee Mora. Sylvia Daniela Moreno. Eduardo Manuel Morera. Alec Frederick Mauser. Jeffrey M. Murphy. Rachel Sophia Murphy. Elena Muzz. Kelsey L. Nelson. Molly Elizabeth Nelson. Nick M. Nevin. Remy Lakun S. Ogansanya. Elizabeth Temiteo Ojo. Maria K. O'Keefe. Parth Yaten Patel. Ryan Gregory Peasley. Julia M. Petchy. Jason Alexander Petty. 
Marissa Ashlyn Piccolo. Dylan C. Platt. Jasper S. Premack. Delaney Kathleen McComb Prutney. Susanna Abigail Richmond Ranzo. Zachary Brennan Rieger. Samuel S. Renner. Luke David Real. Christine Dolores Robb. Victoria Grace Rose. Laura K. Russell. Alec Zenaido Sandler. Nicholas Vincent Sardi. Allie Saunders. Julian Guido Savelski. Kathleen C. Schmidt. Benjamin James Schroeder. Karishma Atul Shah. Samantha Elizabeth Sherman. Nancy Shu. Adam C. Simon. Louise Kathleen Simpson. Eric Paul Singerman. Tamara S. Skinner. Spencer A. Slaybaugh. Michaela Veda Smith. Rachel E. Smith. Michael C. Springer Ingram. Lauren Sage Spungen. Alan Joe Steiner. Summer Charis Stevens. Amber S. Stewart. Leonor Beatrice Suarez. Joshua Alexander Sullivan. Daniel Sung. Caitlin Marissa Sussman. Bailey Hawks Swainston. Robert P. Taglia. Me, Amy Tung. Alberto Palo Tome. Colin Blair Tyndall. Amanda Van Auken. Spencer Jackson Villardi. 
Caroline Ann Veniro. Henry Walter. Claudia Wang. Ryan Thomas Wellis. Fleet Russell White III. Stephen Joseph Wickman. <laughs> Ellen Anka Winsek. <laughs> Natasha Maria Wiltz. Tyler Marshall Wood. Candace J. Yandem Riviere. Joshua Payam Yasma. Kaylee Marissa Yokum. Chloe Malin Zagrodsky. Andrew K. Zeller. Carol Tinyu Zhang. Jun Chao Zhang. Eric Ray Zimmerman. Congratulations to the JD class of 2022. So now we come to the conclusion of the law school's hooding and diploma ceremony. Uh, but we have uh, a final lesson. Uh, there's a lesson in externalities. Uh, so the way this will work is that the faculty and the graduates will process out through the rear of the chapel. And then we ask two things, that the families and friends utilize the side exits and then we welcome everyone across the midway to a reception at the law school. And so we ask that you don't linger too long in front of the chapel because there's another unit of the university coming in here for their graduation ceremony. We don't want to impose the externality of them, of creating chaos for them as they grow up. And one other point, as we progress, of course, to the, across the midway to the law school, it is a celebratory moment. But also, please know that in the middle of the Midway, another unit of the university is having their ceremony out on the Midway. So again, let's not oppose an externality on them either. So again, let's have one additional round of applause before we process for the class of 2022. Congratulations.